Hello and welcome to the Innovation Book Club, the podcast that makes sense of the big ideas that drive creativity and innovation. We're your hosts, Alex Drago and Weiss Bassard, and we believe that while there's never been a greater need for new ideas, perspectives and solutions, understanding exactly what innovation is and how it works has never been more difficult or confusing. So our purpose for this podcast is clear. In each episode, we take an important text from the innovation field, deconstruct it, and then talk through the key ideas to help you develop a more innovative mindset. Okay then, so today we're going to look at a paper called Evolving to a New Dominant Logic for Marketing. originally published in 2004 in the Journal of Marketing and it's by two academics Stephen Vargo and Robert Lush right and so they they both sort of come from marketing backgrounds but they they bring a lot to their understanding of marketing and that becomes really important and in fact Stephen Vargo was a student of Robert Lush. Uh, and that's how they met. That's how they ended up uh, collaborating. Now, Robert Lush passed away in 2017. He, he had cancer. But Stephen Vargo was still teaching. And, and you can find actually uh, a lot of his um, lectures on, on YouTube. Yeah. I suppose the background to this paper is that you know Stephen Vargo studies were originally in psychology and social psychology right that's what he's bringing that's his his perspective Robert Lush has a very sort of interesting background he actually grew up in a family business and from or as a teenager he was doing sales and marketing so he sort of developed this <laughs> inherent ability to understand what businesses are trying to do but it turned out he was very bright and and he went on did an mba he went on did a phd right and over time he has this sort of slow realization that markets or the marketplace it is not a artificial construction it is actually an extension of our social structures that we have as humans and and because it is an extension of our social structure they require a certain morality and a set of ethics in order to govern the way that we engage in the marketplace for the marketplace to to uh, um, operate efficiently right so so for him then marketing is is inherently social it's not just the end point of the supply chain yeah and that flavors the development of of this article so it's worth noting that this article although it was published in 2004 was originally written in 1999 and for a number of reasons it's not published for five years okay and one of the things that that you learn about from interviews with Robert Lush is that it actually got very little support from the start. Oh, really? So when you submit to an academic journal, it goes to a panel and the panel say, you know, yes or no, or it needs some work here. You know, it's not quite good enough there. Da, da, da. And I think it went through like four or five revisions wow. before it was published. Wow. <laughs> five years, basically. Yeah. Yeah. There's another reason, which is that Robert Lush becomes the editor of that journal and you can't publish your own work <laughs> while you're the editor <laughs> of the journal. So they wait and then it goes through this sort of ongoing development process. But it's interesting that a few of the academics that are offering insight think it's a waste of time. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so let's come back to that maybe at the end and and actually you know pick and, and and analyze why that why that is the case yes but before we sort of go into it what we need to understand is what is a dominant logic right 
And a dominant logic really refers to the mental models that we use to approach a certain task. So it can be micro level, it could be macro level. So if you're in your job, you have a dominant logic that defines what success looks like, right? And therefore you follow a certain set of rules in order to deliver that success, right? Right. And we kind of refer to that as culture nowadays. But they're talking from marketing perspective, obviously. But on a bigger scale, there are also dominant logic. So every business model is a dominant logic. It's, it's a set of assumptions about how value is created for customers, about what customers actually want, and how we derive value from that process as a business owner. Right. And then on an even bigger scale, there's a dominant logic to how the marketplace itself works. Right. And really in this paper, they're questioning the logic that underpins how that marketplace functions and what, and therefore what the role of marketing really is in that process. Right. And that's why it's really groundbreaking and that's why it has such a big impact uh, on other fields of study apart from marketing. And so the the article sort of begins with a brief history of marketing. So they go back to classical economics, they go back to Adam Smith, you know, and in the wealth of nations and essentially firms are manufacturing goods for export. That's that's how you derive value for the country or or for the nation and um in order to do that, you need great resources. You, the resources are put together to produce a good. You sell that good. You export that good. And so marketing emerges as this sort of extension of that process. It is the interface between customers and the manufacturing process. So it's right at the end of the supply chain. Right. So, so marketing emerges as propaganda. Right. It's like this product is great. You should buy it. Yeah. And and that's how it starts. And that they define as the goods dominant logic. Right. So the nature and features of the good itself are the focus. Yes. So like this is the vacuum cleaner. It has ten features. You have to buy it. You need it done. It's not it's like one way. Yeah. Yeah. So the value is created in the manufacturing process because you've got these great resources, you've put them together, produces a great good. We're going to advertise what you can do with that good or market it. And and that's how marketing works. They define what the customer's needs and they assume the needs of the customers completely by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. By the time you get to the sort of post-war period in the 1950s, your marketing starts to change and you see the development of segmentation models. You see the evolution of the four P's model. So price, product, promotion, place. You see that marketing becomes a core function to help a business realize its objectives of selling more stuff. It's, it's not an afterthought. It, it starts to become more central to the business. By the time you then get to the 1980s, the idea of marketing is splintered. Right. So, you know, yeah, okay, it's the four Ps, but it's a lot more than that. Services marketing, network development, resource management, you know, uh, and on and on and on. And then by the 1990s, there's a period there where they're starting to question marketing's own past. Right. And whether it's actually good enough. And so it's not exactly a legitimacy crisis where you're saying, oh, we don't need marketing anymore. But you're questioning what marketing is and what it can achieve. Right. And so the things that marketing used to do, like the propaganda bit or the four Ps bit, they're seen as sort of frameworks that are good. You need to use them. But actually they start to question the paradigm itself, the limitations of marketing under the goods dominant logic. Right. So if marketing 
can only tell people about how good a product is, what's the future of marketing? Yes, that's the question. And so this begins to emerge really with services. So services are intang intangible. You know, how, how do you market a service when it has no features as such? Right. You start to f a focus on the benefits that the service actually brings. But the dominant logic that dominates the creation of services is still within the goods dominant logic that you have to have a set of resources you creating that service even if it's intangible it's still created as you would create a good or a product and then you, your marketing function then tells people how wonderful something is yeah so the value is being created by the producers and the, and the, the need is being defined by the producers exactly yeah And so people are then starting to question what comes next. And there's this really nice um, quote from Gummerson and he it was from 1995, and he says, uh, "Customers do not buy goods or services; they buy offerings which render services which create value." The traditional division between goods and services is long outdated. It is not a matter of redefining services and seeing them from a customer perspective. Activities render services. Things render services. The shift in focus to services is a shift from the means and the producer perspective to the utilization and the customer perspective. Right. So... What Vargo and Lush then do is they take that idea and they say, actually, this represents a shift in the dominant logic that defines how we do business. And then the rest of the article, they're going through and saying, you know, this is what we understand by the new dominant logic. And marketing has to evolve in order to help us do that. And they then call that service dominant logic does that make sense so far yes definitely it relates to so basically what 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 vargo and lush lush said was related to the last part of the quote of uh, gummerson which says the that there is needs to shift basically in the perspective of the producer about the utilization and customer perception yeah absolutely that's their starting point yeah. okay Yeah. Okay, great. And so Vargo and Lush, then they question what the idea of service is. And so they start that by saying what a service isn't. Mm -hmm. And and basically what's happened is that we've been producing goods for so long that services just become the intangible bits to enhance the, the good itself. Right. And uh, Or it's things we can't define as goods. Mm-hmm. They put serve, what service isn't into three different categories. So the first one is the restricted traditional conceptualizations that often treat services as a re residual, i.e. that which is not tangible. Right. right. So it's like you either produce goods or services, but a service is what you can't p drop on your foot, basically. Yeah, it's not physical. Yeah. Or it's the second one is something offered to enhance a good, so value added service. So I oh, will, you know, don't worry about buying this widget. We'll make sure that it's still guaranteed for a year by sending somebody out to fix it if there's a problem, right? Right. That sort of value added service. Or this sort of the final one is this catch all where you can't really define it. So education is a service. Healthcare <laughs> is a service. Government yeah. is because you can't literally drop it on your, <laughs> on your foot, right? Yeah. So what they're saying is that service is not the same as our traditional view of what services are. Right. You can produce services with a goods dominant logic, and that's why they're rejecting it. Mm -hmm. That's still mm -hmm. the same problem. So they then define services as the application of specialized competencies, either the knowledge and skills, 
through deeds, processes, and performances for the benefit of another entity or the entity itself. And so they narrow it down, but they're actually saying that 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 works because service dominant logic represents a philosophy that actually what we are doing is not selling goods and services. Right. We are trying to, as Gummerson states, utilize from the customer's perspective. What does the customer actually want? That's what we're providing service, not some random good that may or may not do what they need. Right. So it's a very distinct reorientation in the philosophy. Okay, so once they've then said, actually, what we're trying to do is render service, not create products, they then focus on the resources that you need in order to render that service. So we typically treat resources as something neutral, right? It's a raw material. You need a bunch of stuff and you do something to it in order for that to become a, a an output in some way. Right. Right. You need a human intervention to actually do that. But what they do is they split up the kind of resources that you need. So you need what they call operand resources with a D at the end, operand resources. And they are the resources in which an operation or act is performed to produce an effect. Right. So the raw materials are operand resources. Right. And then there are operant resources which are employed to act on operand resources right so operant with a t right and so that's the human element what human skills do you need in order to act on the operand resources right in order to render the service right so in the past we've always focused on operand resources Goods, 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 goods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what goes into goods? So Adam Smith is like, well, how do you get cheaper goods? How do you use the goods, sorry, the raw materials? How do you get cheaper raw materials? How do you use them more efficiently? Right. Is less focus on the skills that you actually need to render the service from those raw materials. And what do you mean by the last one? Like render the... Uh, the service eventually with the, what skills you need you mean like Adam Smith focused on uh, how they can produce cheaper products with the resources they have but they saw service as a part of the goods itself but uh, didn't see service as something which eventually creates value for the customer is that correct Yes, and, and we'll come to that later because what Vargo and Lush actually say is that we are not shifting from an economy that was focused on goods-dominant logic right. to one that is focused on service-dominant logic. It's that the economy has always been a service-dominant logic, but during the industrial period, what happened was that the idea of the rendered service was so separated from the customer that we forgot about it. Right, right. Because we were so focused on how can we do this more cheaply, how can we do this more efficiently, what features can we actually put in this? And as, you know, manufacturing is outsourced to Asia or, you know, or wherever, that becomes further, further separated. And what you have around the same period as they are writing is the emergence of all these sort of management thought processes, which are about trying to put the service element back into the manufacturing. So total quality management, you know, lean manufacturing. And all that sort of stuff is about trying to keep one eye on the service that your product is actually rendering. Right. Okay. Rather than just producing a good. But we'll come to that. A, a, a little later but you know un, the, the point is that under the goods dominant logic 
we treat the primary resources as the operand resources, the raw materials. You need the best inputs to create the best outputs. Right. We sort of forgot a bit about the operant resources. And operant resources, the human resources, the skills, the knowledge, the expertise, actually became more important in the late 20th century because of our shift toward knowledge work. Right. And so under a service-dominant logic, what you need are a set of core competencies, a set of organizational processes, a business culture that actually supports higher quality operant resources. Right. The problem is they're dynamic, they're invisible, they're intangible. You only miss them when they're not there. And so they're very, very difficult to to measure and, and to understand. Yeah. So they give the example of the microprocessor, right? The microprocessor, it, it doesn't. If you put the best sand into the microprocessor, it doesn't really make much difference. What makes the difference is the human cognitive functions that has transported or transformed uh, silicon into you know, a processor that that can do thousands, millions of operations, right? Second or something like that, you know. So under the service dominant logic, what happens is that you've got a shift from the operand resources into the operant resources. Right. And so operant resources are become the primary type of resource because they're the ones that they can leverage the value out of the raw materials. Right. This how therefore has the potential to change the way we think about our relationships with customers, about how markets work and how the exchange process takes place because you have to then think differently about what service the customers actually want rendered. And that is about operant resources more than it is about operand resources. Right. I mean, what do you think so far? It's quite, it's quite a lot to get your head around because our set of assumptions that we have are about how you make goods yeah i agree with that many of my my ideas myself uh my own ideas were like i want to i want to build something for myself or a company like what type i question majority of time the product itself what type of product i have to uh, create or develop or invent what type of a product um, um i have to find and besides that also based on what this article uh, this paper says I also assumed, okay, this when I would find a product, I would assume people would need it. Right. This is the best product. It has the best features. I've researched it. I haven't found any better one, and therefore everybody needs it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. Yeah, I recognize it a lot. So they they give sort of five things that sort of define goods dominant logic. So that you know the purpose of economic activity is to make and distribute stuff, right? Right. <laughs> stuff that can be sold. To be sold, all things must be embedded with utility and value during the production and distribution process. Right. You know, so the firm should set all decision variables at a level that enables to maximize profit hmm. from from sales. You know, f for both maximum production control and efficiency, the good has to be standardized and yeah. produced away from the market in order to take advantage of, you know, efficiency. And the good can then be inventoried until it's demanded and then delivered to the customer at a profit, right? Yeah, it reminds me of uh, oil companies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, and that's really, you know, what, what informs our, how we understand economics to work in terms of demand and supply but how our economies have grown up. It's always been about producing stuff. And actually, we've thought very little about what's the value that the customer actually wants, what service do they actually want, want to render from that. Yeah. And so, so what Vargo and Lush are doing is, is that they reach a point where it's like, well, if it's like that, Marketing is just about forcing messages onto people to convince them to buy more stuff. Yeah. Your services is, is just becomes a sort of psychological security. You know, 
even if it does, it won't break down, but even if it does, we're going to offer you a maintenance contract or whatever. So you, you know, but it's still adding more value in, in the goods dominant logic way. Exactly. Yeah. So, so what they're saying is then, well, if, if that's the limited limitations of marketing under that logic, well, how would you view the creation of goods under a different view? If you were, producing goods under a better marketing lens then then how would you do it and and so what they say is that because marketing is that sort of customer focused end what what you're doing is that you are constantly engaging with customers in order to understand what they need what service they require and therefore, what you are suggesting is that all you can do is create a value proposition. And you're testing the value proposition with the customer. Right. And you know the service is one that is needed if the value proposition is one that they agree with. Right. So therefore, what what, what a service-centered view, a service-dominant logic view is is that you're identifying or developing core competencies, knowledge and skills that that allow you to um, identify potential customers, understand what they what they really really need, cultivate the kind of relationships that allow you to sustain those, develop value propositions, and then gauge feedback from customers. Right in order to adapt what, what you're actually doing. So that places marketing at the center of business rather than just it's the final bit of the supply chain. Right. And so it moves it beyond traditional views of being customer-focused where you're kind of doing things to customers. You're customer-focused because we've segmented everybody into really understanding what service they re require and what is the value proposition that meets that service requirement how can you test it basically what needs needs to be fulfilled or what problem needs to be solved right exactly that's the, what the focus should shift from marketing that's what they're saying yeah 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 that's exactly right okay is the is the dog wagging the tail or is the tail wagging the dog right <laughs> you know <laughs> And I think under the, the goods dominant logic, sometimes the 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 tail is wagging the dog, right? Because you, the 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 company is producing a bunch of stuff that the customer doesn't really want, but we're going to force it on them anyway through a set of marketing processes. Yeah, you know, very aggressive marketing processes. And actually, what they're saying is, no, it needs to be the other way around. You need to find out what customers want, what service they want from this particular sector, and then build the business around that dynamically. Right. So rather than benefits, that, rather than features, you're talking about value propositions. Because if you can adapt to changing value propositions, you're going to be more financially successful. Right. Rather than... Here's something we've put out this year. Let's hope it does well through our marketing uh, processes. Oh, that didn't do very well. Let's do a better one next year. Yeah, interesting. It shows us the shift of the how how companies make assumptions. Like like goods dominant logic companies, they assume what people need. And and the service uh, dominant logic is like we don't assume what people need. We're going to ask them what they need, or we're going to observe, or whatever it is. We're going to engage them, uh, defining what they need. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's like saying we produce, you know, widgets or whatever, you know. But you're no longer saying that you're producing. We we exist in this particular field of widgetness. And we're going to create the value that customers really want. And that means changing the widgets or how the widgets function because it's based on. That can be the result. Yeah. 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 
you know, rather than we, we produce the best widgets. You know? Exactly. <laughs> and therefore you need them. Yeah, <laughs> the way you said it, we produce the best need, uh, best widgets, and therefore you need them. Is going to shift to, we we are widget producers. We would like to know what you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How can what we do render some yeah. service to you to help you in your life in some way? Exactly. Yeah. And and if you listen informally to what they both say, you're saying, well, the world has always worked like that. Uh, the goods dominant logic way you mean no the, the no service was always what people it was how the because because the marketplace is a social structure right actually what was common there was was people either ne were offering service or were the beneficiaries of service the point of the marketplace was that's the social place where that dialogue takes place Right. So even in, you know, primitive or medieval times, you know, you go to the marketplace because you have a need to fulfill and other people are in the marketplace saying we can fulfill that need for you. Right. What happened during the industrialization process was that those things were just really became very distant. Right. In order to maximize economic return. Right. They had resources, they needed to do something with the resources. Let's make products. Oh, products can make us profits. People need those <laughs> products <laughs> distributed. Yeah, yeah. And and the driver of that from Wealth of Nations was how do you export? How do you do it more efficiently? How do you export it? Yes, exactly. And so the service bit kind of got lost. Well, I, I imagine why how they would think that that would be a good model why because if a company uses resources to build products it employs people and people employed can use the vacuum cleaners they uh, create and improve with new features they enjoyed it and therefore it creates employment it creates economy and therefore when everybody has some food on the table because of this uh, model Therefore, we need to increase it and scale it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think it's like, um, is it the Ford Edsel, which is this just, you know, Ford's greatest mistake? And yeah. they produced this car that was like, it's going to have this feature, it's going to have exactly. that. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it turned out they weren't the features that people wanted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They didn't ask anybody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What What is the service that this car, this automobile, automobile can render to you and it turned out that the experts who made it were wrong and actually what what people really wanted was something else entirely yeah exactly but because they employed a lot of people and it uh, dr drove the economy <laughs> in, in a certain way it was one of the best models at that time <laughs> absolutely because and that's the goods dominant logic approach right right yeah you know the 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 you know my work in museums are, it's it's totally driven by goods dominant logic i mean more than almost any other sector <laughs> because what you have is a bunch of experts curators who are the experts in their field right saying well the government has given us money because culture is important and i'm the expert so therefore i know what people need to know about culture and actually what happens is that you know, the upper middle classes go, oh, that's great. That's right up my street because I share exactly the same values as the curator. But for most people in the street, they just don't care. Yeah. Because nobody has gone out and said, what's the service really that, that museums can render that's going to have an impact in your life? So basically there is a shift needed in the museums. Yeah, of course. Such a shift. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's everywhere, right? Yeah, but, but I'm just using that as as a particular example because we have so embedded the idea of the expert within the museum sector because the nature of culture of material culture requires research, and at some point in the 19th century we decided that that would be a good model. Yeah, it comes down in, uh, in the museums as an example or whatever uh, company or type of industry it is. It comes down to 
the existence itself, can they still exist? And the goods dominant logic shows, and which is the case, I think, in museums also, the budgets are shrinking and the engagement is low. And therefore, like they're questioning themselves based on the their current mental models or business models they have. Yeah. And they think probably it brought us food on the table, this model. So we need to do work more with this model. It brings the same food, but they're not realizing that if you, if you follow the service dominant logic, you probably will still have food. It's not about more food, but still have food in the next <laughs> coming period. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and again, it comes back to that idea. Well, what's the dominant logic model that you're using in order to base your assumptions around your work? Right. Yeah, you know, that's why we covered it off like really, you know, at the top. What they do in the paper is they provide six foundational premises, I think, or eight, I can't remember, but they then go and add to them later. Right. And so they actually end up with 10, which really is the sort of defining characteristics of, of service dominant logic. So it's worth just sort of covering those. So the first one is service is the fundamental basis of exchange. So the, the point of doing business is not to produce goods. The point of business is to be able to offer service, right? Right, yeah. The second one is indirect exchange masks the fundamental basis of exchange, right? So the point is not money. The point is that the money represents the exchange of the service. Right, yeah, so again, it's about the service. Third one, goods are distribution mechanisms for service provision. So uh, goods derive their value through use. What service does this provide? It doesn't have an inherent value. Its own the value is only realized when you're using it, but we'll come back to that. Fourth one, operant resources, so the human resources, are the fundamental source of competitive advantage. Right. So it's not the raw materials, it's what you what what skills you need to do something with the raw materials that are actually what drive your competitive nature. Right. All economies are service economies, that's the fifth one, right? So um it's not that we've shifted from a uh, a goods dominant economy to a service dom dominant economy. It was just that the, we were industrializing and outsourcing um, the service, essentially. Right. Six one, the customer is always a co-creator of value. So um, value creation is interactional. So it doesn't matter if you're creating the best umbrella, right? No. It only has value if it's raining or if you're in a very hot country if you need some protection from the sunshine, right? It doesn't exactly. matter. It has no value unless you, you know, that's how it is. So the enterprise, the seventh one is the enterprise cannot deliver value, but only offer value propositions. So you're putting out a value proposition, but because the value itself is only co-created, right? That's all you can do. Yeah. The value is not inherent in the product. So proposing like you need this vacuum cleaner with 150 features to customers and then getting feedback from them like, yes, we need the 50 of uh, features, but not the, these 100 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a, the value is on the acceptance of the value proposition. Exactly. So the organization yeah. keeps only proposing and based yeah. on the feedback they're going to produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, eighth one. A uh, service-centered view is inherently customer-oriented and relational. You know, so because value is co-created, right, it can only work that way. So it, it's not, you're not doing things to customers. We're not segmenting them. We're not targeting them. You're co-creating with them, right? right. That, that's the point. Ninth one, all economic and social actors are resource integrators. So... Networks, this is about networks. Networks are important. Right. Uh, value, and the 10th one, value is always uniquely and phenomenological determined by the beneficiary. 
So you, what you can't do is say, I'm the expert. I've made this for you. This is the value that it brings. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> the customer is saying, well, this is what the value that I get from this. I don't care what you say, right? Yeah. So they, they say the value is idiosyncratic, experiential, contextual, and meaning laden. It's, but again, it's about the value at the customer end, right? Right. Yeah, definitely. How, how you intend value to be created as the, as, the, um, uh, as the business is often so different to the value that the customer actually derives from that. So basically not saying you need this washing machine is uh, I I know yeah yeah so it's basically not saying you need this washing machine because I am the expert of washing machines, it's it's like you need you, we have this washing machine with these features and I'm an expert in building it. Can you tell me if you need this? Yeah yeah right exactly yes <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and I guess now I suppose this emerged you know when it did because technology allows you to start engaging and analyzing customers in ways that you couldn't before you right. know so the very difficult in an industrial age in the 19th century to uh, i'm going to do some design thinking and so on and so on <laughs> but, but it probably did happen informally you know right you know so i think it's um isambard kingdom brunel who is one of britain's great sort of industrial designers as it were and he had a hand in many great industrial things. But one of the things he did was um, a railway that basically went from London to the southwest, like Bristol and places like that. Right. And and interestingly, one of the features he di- designed was that you didn't have to step off trains. Oh, wow. It, the, the train, the, the level of the train was the same level as the platform. Oh, that's nice. And that's somebody understanding what people need. Yeah, yeah. How well? Maybe they. Well, that's a good one. He understands how he can improve the experience of of the of the commuters. Like maybe people don't understand or are not conscious about what that they need that as a solution. But he understood that it's adding service. It's servicing basically the travelers. And if you think about the size of the. Um, dresses that women wore at that time and so on and so on. You right. Know, that, that's great, you know. Right, yeah. I mean, it's a very simple uh, uh, simple example. But the point of those foundation of principles is that you see that, you know, that what you're doing is rendering service. What you're doing is providing a value proposition about the service that you are rendering. Right. But actually that, in itself is not enough. The value is only created by the customer as they are using it. Right. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter what you think. That's the, <laughs> it's, it's the value is only realized in use by the customer. Yeah. And so a bit later on, sort of Vargo works with another academic called Akeka to offer three clarifications, which kind of sum up their view. And they're saying, the first one is there are no services. You're either rendering service or you're not, right? (laughs) You can serve, but you can't do services. So services is just this clunky word that we're using because it's not a good. So basically it says that that's, if if the washing machine manufacturer says we have a lot of services, it means we have a repair guy, we have a delivery guy, we have a, I don't know, some other guy who does something with washing machines. Oh, te- yeah, test guy who tests the washing machine. Those are the services. But now Var- Vargo and Akeka say it's not about the service it's itself, it's about service, servicing basically the customer. Yeah, what is that holistic service that that number of things that you've described is providing? So the service the washing machine manufacturer is giving is enabling people to wash, have clean clothes. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. That's the focus, basically. Yeah, shift. Uh, time saved or whatever it is. You know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Which means that, the, and that's the second one. There's not a new service economy that, that's emerging. You know, so they're saying that service has always been the basis of exchange, but what happened, like I said, during the industrial revolution, is that it becomes so separated from the customer itself because you're producing on mass and you're exporting. Yeah. So it's not goods dominant logic or you know service dominant logic. It's the fact that a goods dominant logic is not a very good way to render service. Right. And then the third one is value is always co-created. You know, if goods are used as vehicles of service, they might be co-produced, but the co-creation of value is not optional. The value is only realized by people using it right yes so so receiving the service in in some way so basically asking asking users of washing machines what how they uh, what features the next washing machines uh should have what they would like uh, to have see in their washing machines and their next one it's like yeah well no it, it moves beyond that right so that's that's part of it but suppose that you are a washing machine um uh, manufacturer right. and you're like i've created the best ever washing machine right absolutely brilliant i'm like brilliant i'll buy one of those right uh, but it's too big to get through my door right for me the value is never realized because it's never used right for you it's like brilliant i've sold another one Right. So the value is only realized through use. Yeah, exactly. So it's 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 the value is all like in the in the list as value is always co-created means basically the value a washing machine has is basically that people are getting on a timely matter clean clothes. Yeah, that. that service which is rendered. Yeah, exactly. So the focus of the manufacturer should be like, how can we help you customers to have faster, cleaner clothes? Yeah, yeah. Instead yeah. of new features. And the result can be new features. The result can be the new size of a washing machine or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. okay. Nice. Yeah. I mean, a better example would be like, well, we've redesigned the same size of the washing machine a front-loading washing machine, but it holds twice as much. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So effectively, you're doubling the amount of service that you're rendering through a redesign process. Because if you got you've got a family and there's five of you in that family, it's like, well, somebody's got to stand there and do you know five loads. <laughs> well, maybe you can do that in two or three loads now, right? And it uses less water, maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So. You know, so it's again, it's it's the I suppose when we think about the implications for innovation, it it is what is the, what what is the service you are rendering, or what is the value proposition that you are rendering, right? And if you think about in our sort of preliminary conversations, you're saying, well, you know. 70, 80, 90% of service of startups fail. Well, it's because they're not rendering service that people want. They're rendering products they think people want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. I must say that it's not easy to think in this way. Like I've been, oh, I've been raised like that. I've been, I've yeah. gone to school where I learn history of companies, organizations, institutions where they create goods, they transport goods, they steal goods, they would do whatever with goods. Um, and also in my experiences within a different organization, it's all about we need a new good or, or, or even on TV or books I read, it's always majority of time it's about the new good people need. And, and if I think about it myself, like, okay, how would you shift towards, okay, what I'm going to create a startup, what service I'm going to provide people instead of saying, I assume this good they need. <laughs> it's not easy. And, and I, 
and and I've seen um, I've read an uh, example of Airbnb where they created like uh, uh, a website where people can rent uh, uh, for a day a couch or something, and eventually it became rooms and apartments and so on and so forth. But in the beginning, they assumed people they they just need apartments and so on and therefore a website is enough for them to launch and create a, a growing revenue but they almost went bankrupt because of their assumptions why because they were also their model was also dom uh, goods dominant logic based on that and eventually when they start asking like why are people are not booking within our platform what they did is they literally went to new york they went to customers and they asked them, interviewed them, like, okay, why are you not booking uh, through our website? One said, like, the majority of them said, we don't understand what type of a room or apartment it is based on the pictures it is, uh, has it, it, the pictures on the website. because, And they learned that the pictures made by the homeowners were really bad quality because it's made by their phones or their cameras. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what they did, they started creating pictures for a few weeks, professional pictures to put on the platform. After that, they asked people uh, about uh, the model itself, how how they uh, would want to get serviced uh, a rumor uh, uh, compared to hotels and so on. And this way, by engaging with the customers, they co-created the value eventually, which the platform now right. delivers. Right. Yeah. So that's really a nice example of how also this um, um, this paper says an organization should behave or act create value basically co-creating with the people yeah 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 the interesting thing about Airbnb right is that they essentially have two sets of customers right so they have you or I that would book a room or whatever it might be right but then it's obviously the people the hosts who are also you know, uh, customers and that example, I remember hearing that in an interview and thinking that, yeah, that's, I understand why that is because only Airbnb were the people that could understand the service that was actually, that they were trying to render to both sets of customers. Right. And how they were connected. Yeah. Yeah. Basically the exactly what, exactly. Yeah. So people want to book a apartment, they go on the platform, they don't understand, trust uh, what they see, and therefore they don't book. And, and, the, and the homeowners assume that their pictures are fine and so on. So, so, so they assume that people are booking and don't understand why, why they're booking. So Airbnb, as a middleman, talked to the, uh, both of them and I understood what they actually needed because they said what they needed. And why they right. feel how they feel when they go on the platform. Right, right. I mean, there are the fundamental implication, uh, and it goes back to what you were saying there about, well, we, we think, we've always thought, and we've grown up thinking in a goods dominant logic, is that it's easier to think in a goods dominant logic, right? Right. And and if you're just copying what somebody's done before, then then you can get away with it, right? Because you know that there is a demand. But innovation is not, that's not what innovation is. And so if you are going to embrace a sort of service dominant logic, you're no longer just designing the best product. You actually have to design an ecosystem in which you cohabit with the customer and with your suppliers. Right. Because otherwise you're just pushing out a, a, a manufactured good. Right. And so if you think about uh, Tesla, for example, mm -hmm. if Tesla was just making, you know, uh, petrol driven internal combustion engine cars. Right. They wouldn't need the kind of ecosystem that they have had to develop because what you do is you just design a car and you sell those either through a garage or through whatever it is, right? right. And then it goes away and uh, and people fill it with petrol or diesel or whatever it is and, and it functions. But the fact of the matter is that Tesla is 
producing electric cars. So therefore, the ecosystem that they need in order to create the car is, is one thing. So you need a different design process. You need battery suppliers. You need software suppliers because you're doing something new, right? Right. And then once it gets out in the real world, it's another ecosystem because you're changing the way that you are charging your car, how you are refilling your car. So if you have a petrol car, petrol or diesel, you're like, oh, the the light's gone off. I better get some petrol. I'll pull into this service station, and it takes you two, three minutes or whatever it does, right, right. to do the transaction. Batteries don't work like that. No, it, it's, it, it shows that it creates a whole new industry, not only uh, benefiting uh, Tesla itself, but it's creating such an industry that's benefiting the whole environment, the whole environment, the whole market, basically. Yeah. So you, w- what you have to have then is, well, where do people charge cars oh when they're parked yeah right so so my sister has a hybrid and so when she she always goes to a certain car park in newcastle right because then she can just plug it in while she's off for a couple of hours doing a business or whatever yeah yeah exactly and so that there is a whole range of implications about how you manage that ecosystem have you read how they co-created this service no, oh, no, interesting. But I mean, I know that they had to give away a load of patents, right? Basically, ah, yes, they made an open source in order to help facilitate. I remember also that they gave away a lot of Teslas, also to test. Right. Yeah, they tested it uh, in the US. They gave a lot of Teslas, and they asked feedback, like from customers, how they experienced it. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So there's no point saying. Oh, this Tesla's perfect the moment it rolls out of the garage. Right? <laughs> because 200 miles later, when the batteries run out. Yeah, what do we need to do now? <laughs> and we're, exactly. we're sending the repairman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a completely different ecosystem that they've had to develop. That's interesting. I mean, you talk about the ecosystem. I, I'm, I'm like curious what kind of other businesses, first of all, have created such ecosystems or are, are, are busy right now creating such ecosystems um, and what, what would would be be able to create you no know, start businesses or organizations to trigger cr- the ecosystem creation well the you know the big ones are like Amazon for example yeah you know which is uh, massively customer focused right it, it is about the value that that is the you know, the service that you're rendering so i've mentioned for example my mum you know who's blind which means for her amazon is a is a just a lifesaver right it's podcasts it's music it's um audiobooks it's how she gets stuff delivered you know that the, the service which it renders right is it is incredible compared to like well i can't even work out how the remote control works now i don't under, i can't see the knob on the radio and so on and so on and that's an exact very extreme example because i, I recognize my mum is, is a niche audience but that that service which is rendered is is in, incredible and it's only possible because they have built an ecosystem around it people yeah it's not it's not just like we've got a warehouse here or we're even connecting to a supplier who can provide this. Yeah, that's actually a good one because when people, when Amazon creates new products, I, am, I, I know that you can review any type of product or service of them on their websites. And besides that, they measure almost everything from their, from their systems. Every click, even when right. people go to right. product pages and they let go, they analyze statistically why and how and when and use that as a yeah. basis to co-create their next products. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, some of the practices, not so no. sure about. <laughs> but but <laughs> that's maybe going a bit too far, you know. But But yeah, absolutely. But I imagine, yeah, now you're saying this, they have Alexa. I imagine... That's um, 
because they probably um, has in their terms and conditions has put that they are using their your the sounds everything that your uh, the sounds uh, of Alexa is saving they are using it or something and I can imagine they can use it for their product development everything Alexa hears like every question yeah. even the questions I imagine that would be a imagine Amazon is going to give us access to their Alexa database and I would uh, be interested okay which questions are not being answered and who are those people uh, you get the demographics of it and suddenly uh, based on the history of products they have ordered you can you can understand the next need of those types of people like in this case your mother yeah actually my mum she rang me up last week something and said oh i, I want to buy this book for somebody for a present can you order it from amazon for me right I was like, sure. And I went on, tried to, usually I can log on to her Amazon account. Right. And, I, and I rang her up and said, I can't do it because it wants to send you a text message and blah, 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 blah. But you will be able to order it just from Alexa, right? right. And she's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Put the phone down, order it, and then ring me back in five minutes. And she rang back, she was like, that, that for me is incredible. <laughs> That's changed my life. <laughs> really? Did she order it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. And, and, you know, so, so, but again, that only comes from, um, yeah, understanding what customers are trying to buy, but all then also adapting the systems in order to be able to support that through an Alexa system. Yeah, that's true. And eventually, I think Alexa didn't start with all the functionalities it has right now at the beginning. It's over the course of time when they, it's basically asking questions, giving it the orders. So the more data they collected, the more they understood the direction or the development, the evolution eventually the Alexa had to go through to meet the needs of the customers, basically yeah. servicing customers. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that goes back to that sort of idiosyncratic idea of what value is, right? It's not them saying people will use Alexa for reason one, reason two, reason three, and that's it. We'll draw a line under it after that. <laughs> it, it's obviously an analysis of um, what people are or how people are trying to use it and then adapting from that. Right. Yeah. But it, but the focus is on the service that people are trying to get from it, not from, oh, I'm the expert in AI. I've decided how people will want to use a, a voice-activated assistant. Well, they talk about it in the paper about uh, uh, the definition of value, and they say it's one you have value defined by whatever, uh, uh, how you define it. Uh, they give other examples, but it's basically about useful value, what right, you can use. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Value and use they talk about, don't they? That comes down also for Alexa, I think. Yeah, exactly like that, uh, like you did describe it just now. They could create Alexa, like if you want to order, I don't know, a book, could say the name and just you are able to uh, order the most, the top 20 books from Amazon, not more. Right. That, that yeah. I would understand as a good dominant logic. But now what they can do right now, it's almost you can order anything except, I don't know, <laughs> the, the travel itself or the physical yeah, things yeah, you yeah. need to do yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's how they've built the ecosystem, right? Is that they, Amazon started just as books, right? Right. And, and what would happen was that he had relationships with the big book suppliers. You'd fill it in. I want a copy of whatever. Right. It goes away to Amazon. Amazon orders it from a book distributor, sends it to Amazon. Amazon repackages it and sends it to the customer. That's how it started. Right. And so that's how a lot of it still works, right? A big warehouse. Yeah. And the robots move around and they take this, that, and the other, and people pop it in a bag and a box or a bag or whatever, and then they send it out, right? And then that goes to a distribution node, and then somebody is assigned to deliver it from a distribution node, and that person could be an Amazon driver or it could be an independent person who is just doing a few hours every day in order to get through college or whatever. Right. But they've still designed that massive ecosystem. 
right to render that service so i can get something if i order it by 12 o'clock i can have it by nine o'clock if i have a prime account yeah i'm like curious i mean triggered to the question whether it's going to be useful for us if such ecosystems are going to be uh created by the organizations because i because amazon now is also delivering i think in us with uh with drones right yeah so yeah. uh and also in the case of tesla the ecosystem has been created like you don't need any more gas stations where people stand and they right. <laughs> service you but you just need a some place when you can park and plug it in done so i don't know if yeah. it's going to benefit us but that's another question yeah but, yeah yeah absolutely yeah but the, but the it's the logic chain that's going through that so i could set up some things like amazon right, right. But but the fact of the matter is it's disconnected. It's not about Everything the system. It's not about the system yeah. at all. It's Absolutely. It's just I have to use that service and I have to use that service. And every service has its own set of rules. Whereas what Amazon has done is bring those all together so that the so that the ecosystem has a set of rules that allows it to render the service more quickly to the customer. That's actually a good point because if Amazon right now chooses to give you a copy of their entire organization. Here is a login. What do you want to call your company? I don't know, uh, Bezos.com or something, <laughs> because he stopped and he yeah. thinks, yeah, let's create the second Amazon. <laughs> so if he, if he, even if he gets a copy of Amazon called Bezos.com, or even if we call it Wise.com, my name, and they give me the, uh, the, the organizational system from A to Z, even with all those uh, uh, the robots and so on and so forth, I don't think I'm going to be successful because of the right. the lack of the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have not only... It's, it wasn't a switch they turned and the ecosystem was created. They have uh, uh, cre developed it and created it over the course of time while... Uh, uh, creating and co-creating, co-producing the the service or the goods people need. But the but the what's driving the creation of the ecosystem is having clarity around the kind of service that customers want from Amazon. Exactly. Rather than just like, well, there's an ecosystem out there. I'll take advantage of it, and if it doesn't work, then I'll stop doing that. Yeah. Right. That's a whole other perspective, I must say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another good example, I think, is Starbucks, right? Or any coffee shop chain, right? right. So it's, it's not really got much to do with coffee. If you want expert coffee, you will not go to Starbucks, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you True. Know, you, <laughs> you will have it imported from Costa Rica or Colombia or <laughs> Africa or wherever it comes from, right? It is about the environment that they have created, which renders a certain service, right? Exactly. For their customers. So you want to catch up with your friends? Well, let's go to Starbucks, have a chat. You want to do some work? Let's go to Starbucks, sit at the desk and do it. You want somewhere safe for your teenagers to go? Let's go to Starbucks. You want a restaurant shopping? Let's go to stop. It's not anymore about the good itself. It's about the service you provide. Yeah, yeah. It's, and yeah. The, and the goods facilitate that service. So in, you know, in Mexico, for example, when I was there and, you know, my partner was working, I would go to Starbucks because I could get coffee. I could get lunch. They had good Wi-Fi, great desks, good service, toilets. <laughs> Air conditioning. Everything. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's plenty of other places I can get coffee. Yeah, And exactly. better coffee than Starbucks. <laughs> and better food. I mean, it's Mexico, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me of uh, my trips to Afghanistan. And right. when I was there, and I talked with uh, uh, people who worked with some Americans with the army, with the U.S. army, and <laughs> the problem they have, the challenge they had, is like they said, like the U.S. has brought a lot of machines, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, skilled people, uh, experts in the U.S. They came here, they built facilities, they built uh, infrastructure, they built, they provided them with all the goods they need to build Afghanistan, 
but it's not working. Why? <laughs> and I imagine it's related to the fact that they're also goods dominant. They follow the goods dominant logic model. Like they didn't go to the people itself and ask them like, what did they, how can I help you? <laughs> yeah. What, how does, how is service rendered here? Do you, right? let's, let's look, how do you uh, bring water to your home now? Yeah, how do you get from A to Z, A to B, and then l let's try to figure out. And they they just started building roads, building water wells, and after six months, the roads wasn't weren't intact anymore. <laughs> Everything broke down. There's a reason you don't use tarmac, right? In in those kind of countries, <laughs> yes. right? Because it can't stand the sun and it can't take the weight. That's why they're built in concrete. <laughs> and, and the interesting uh, part of this thing, in my opinion, is funny. They 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 have spent I don't know how many trillions of dollars, and eventually asked themselves like, what? what where did we go yeah, from? <laughs> we're leaving now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tragic, right? So you know. it, that says basically that also there needs to be a shift within governments, big institutions. Yeah. Yeah. It's not anymore about what they assume people need. They need a system, they need a banking system, they need this, they need that. But it completely uh, fails at the fact that the people don't need it, need it and use it based on what they assumed actually it would work. Well, it's like that example we talked about right on the first episode when we did the Stephen Johnson book, you know, where good ideas come from. Right. And it was about the... Um, incubators for babies right right and we gave these you know took these wonderful you know you know first class incubators to you know third world country a developing country and they were great until they stopped working and then you couldn't get them fixed exactly <laughs> the same, you know same reasons you're saying and and actually the the people that came in and then solved the problem understood that in order to render that service the mechanics had to be changed to what they could easily they could get easily through their existing supply chains yeah so it's like well let's use car headlights let's you know they yeah, have use, resources yeah yeah to enable that service so that's the difference between the goods dominant logic you need the best incubator right and the service dominant logic which is What's the best way to ensure that we can um, uh, incubate your newborn babies so they're going to survive? Ah, yes. Yeah. So now it triggers me with just what you said to the thought that the service dominant logic is basically about not about the goods and your own assumptions and your own thinking. It's about the how eventually you can reach the goal or the meet the needs of those people and in the process of that it can be it can create new a whole ecosystem out, out of it maybe i'm repeating myself but it just triggers me again to the fact that this is completely different perspective <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely yeah i mean another one that i put in the notes was a few years ago i did a half marathon right somebody said oh, i challenge you to do a half marathon i was like mm. <laughs> Okay, you know, <laughs> right. In three months, you know, and a, I'm not as young as I used to be, but b, I'm actually quite big. I don't have a natural runner's sort of um, figure, right? Yeah. And so I bought some new shoes, but uh, and I did the half marathon. But what prepared me for the for the marathon, the half marathon, w w wasn't the shoes, right? It was the app that Nike provided that said use your shoes in this way six days a week right ah. so run three miles this day as fast as you can right run five miles the next day first mile really fast second mile really slow third mile and so on and so on and so on and over 12 weeks that prepared me for the half marathon i see the value of the shoes was only rendered because of the app <laughs> that's interesting that that's a really good example that shows that Nike isn't anymore in a products uh, products led manufacturing, but it's more like it's it's providing a service, basically a training yeah. for people what they the need. Value, the value yeah. is co-created. Yes, yes, yes. That's beautiful.
That's right. And it, it's also an example I came across was the uh, was a sort of startup company from Germany. Right, yeah. It's uh, let me see what it's called, Mobisol. So they they started um, solving a question about energy in Tanzania. So the people in rural areas um, in Tanzania uh, didn't have uh, electricity. Uh, if they wanted to charge their phones, they had to walk, uh, I don't know, a few miles to a town where there, were streets, where there was electricity. Or they had to buy solar panels, which was really expensive, and they had to rent it. Majority throughout the, in the whole country, people rent solar panels because it's expensive. And besides that, they a lot of people don't buy solar panels because uh, in rural areas, people are not able to fix it and the repairmen of the, from the towns aren't going to the rural areas. It's going to be expensive for them. So therefore, electricity isn't available there. So this company, what they did, instead of also um, following the goods dominant logic, they followed the service dominant logic. What they did is they literally went from Germany to the rural areas uh, in Tanzania and they observed basically what they did uh, interviewed them and try to understand what they actually need the assumptions of the current solar uh, companies within Tanzania and the energy companies in Tanzania was that people just to need uh, energy because they want to switch their lights right and eventually <laughs> and eventually after talking with them and observing them they understood that they don't need energy only to electricity only to power their uh, their their the lamps but also their uh, mobile phones televisions and radios right so so they started uh, they understood that first of all second of all they understood that ownership is very uh, important for the people in rural areas instead of uh, co-owning something like renting something basically so uh, but the income wasn't high and the income was on a monthly basis what you earn you spend they are because there wasn't a banking facility uh, to save money it's difficult for them to buy solar panels so that was also a challenge and and third of all it was challenge to uh, repair uh, the solar panels when they broke or need repair so there was also a challenge and the, and the last one was the fact that uh, um, it was challenging for the solar companies to bring from the towns to the rural areas the solar panels transportation logistics was also challenging so they thought okay how can we solve this problem eventually to uh, provide electricity while observing them and interviewing them they understood there were people whose jobs were literally they they wake up in the morning in rural areas they go towards the town they wait until somebody needs something from the town and their right. rural areas they will transport it so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they thought there is the logistics uh, of our uh, of this idea yeah. And uh, besides that, um, repairmen calling from the town, they didn't come. Do they have a solution? They found out that there were always a tech, the majority of time there was a, a guy or a lady who were, uh, which was technical within a, in a village. So they thought, let's, let's train that tech, te, uh, tech, uh, uh, technical guy or woman to repair the solar panels. And besides that, they, look towards the fact that they couldn't save to pay for solar uh, panels that was an interesting one in my opinion because i relate it a lot to uh, uh, afghanistan itself it's really expensive but they need electricity what they did is they um they give the gave the uh, villagers the opportunity to pay their uh, solar panels in 36 months instead of one-off payment directly right so so they said pay us in 36 months after 36 months you're the owner done right right you don't have to save a lot of money or you don't have to uh, have a bank system completely bank infrastructure to collect your or save your money somewhere so eventually um, by solving this they were able to to provide solar energy for them and it's amazing how they did it. It wasn't like I am Tesla or I am Solar City, a subsidiary of yeah. Tesla, I think. Uh, uh, and therefore, people need solar companies. Here you go. Why are you not buying it? Why are you not having it? You, we have the solution to have free energy uh, villages. It's not anymore about that. And it's yeah. it's beautiful how they co-created the whole ecosystem, like you talked. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. There yeah. are now technicians who are being uh, hired by this uh, company, startup company now to repair uh, solar panels. There are delivery people who are getting jobs. There, uh, The whole ecosystem has been created only in Tanzania and they want to expand now throughout the world. It's amazing how this service dominance logic has, uh, has created value. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. I suppose it's worth saying that... that Service dominant logic is the reason why everything is a subscription these days. You know, if you have a, a, anything digital, is a digital subscription, <laughs> right? Because because it's about the value that is rendered in use, right? So whether it's Office three six five, whether it's Netflix, you know, th- it doesn't really matter, right? But they are learning how you use their product. As, as the service is rendered and then learning from that and then creating something new. Yeah. I imagine that when Netflix or even Prime Video um, try to understand the customers, they would see that it's expensive for me at least. It's expensive for me to rent every week a new video to watch in the weekends or some right. video, a few videos. So there's a barrier of costs for me and they lowered that. I don't know. I'm paying now two ninety nine for prime video and I have <laughs> prime video now. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah. the service I needed was basically entertainment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, and yeah, and the, and the, they've taken the pain out of that, right? Completely. So they, they learn what you like and they make recommendations based on that. And I suppose the bigger ones, you know, Netflix especially, but Prime does it as well now, is that they then use that data to create more of the kind of shows that you like. Yes. Yeah, that's true. And that's how the business model becomes sustainable. Because Netflix would never become sustainable if it just relied on Marvel movies, right? <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, because the, because the, the, the uh, sitting atop of the value chain is is Marvel itself and Disney. Right. Right. So, so you're always going to be paying something to your master there. So what they've done is like, well, actually it's only sustainable if we produce our own entertainment or our own TV programs based on the data that we get from people. Right. Because then, you know, we can use that then to drive the growth of the platform. Yeah, that's true. That also creates, has created a whole ecosystem, the whole film industry uh, has been influenced by the Netflix series and yeah. movies. Whereas now, now you can make a distinctive decision about who you subscribe to based on the kind of products that they produce. Yes. Right. If it was just DVD rental or another kind of rental, you know, is is film rental. Right. You can't do that. You're competing on price. Yes. Who's the cheapest one to rent from or how long do you get it or whatever it is? Right. You know, I suppose HBO are the masters of that, right? The, uh, HBO is like adult entertainment. I mean, <laughs> not pornography, but <laughs> but stuff for adults, adult themed. Yeah. Reality series. series, yeah. Yeah. True. But they wouldn't know that unless they had sufficient data about the audience, about what they watch and so on. Yeah, that's Because true. they understand what value means to them through the feedback loops. Yeah, yeah. And this in, in this era, I think data is going to help any company to understand what customers need. Yeah. It's going to be fundamental for their, uh, on the long term for them. Yeah. Which goes back to the idea that, you know, what you're putting out there is a value proposition and you're testing that value proposition. Yeah. And organizations, I think, need to understand that and accept that. Yeah. Start also acting on that. Like exactly like Lisa said, you're going to put only value proposition, not any more value itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, I mean, we've, there's quite a few examples there, but you, you can look at many places, you know. Google essentially is service dominant logic, right? Because you're not paying up front for most Google services. Yeah, true. Majority is free, a uh, freemium. Yeah. 
free even <laughs> yeah 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 you know so i mean we've gone from like oh it's quite difficult to get your head around this to actually more and more companies are using it it's just becoming how you have to do business yes which leads to an interesting question why did the academics reject it back in 2004 or before it was published five Between years nine in 2004 <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting because this is one of few one of the few academic papers that has sort of escaped its own silo <laughs> that's you nice. know, it's not it's not just about marketing we've we've talked a, about how you how how does that particular view of marketing or what marketing can do then affect and create a better business both in terms of the value that is rendered and but also the creation of value for the companies themselves have you and if you think about the companies that are the most valuable today they are using a service dominant logic no i agree with that and i think it's also because like one of the other podcasts we had about jeremy rifkin right. everything is connected with each other even if you are going to start a company right now and the, and you follow the goods dominant logic you you can't avoid reviews of people feedback of people right. so it's inevitable for a company nowadays to avoid feedback yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so there if and and the, and the fact that they have feedback and they can't avoid it because otherwise people will walk away from your products or services um, they are forced to do something right, with it. Right. Yeah, you're right. So, <laughs> so, so now they are forced to do something. They make a department, put some analysts and some managers on it, like analyze the reviews and try to make sense of it. How can we use it? How can we make sure that we don't make the same mistake? And this is going to be the basis of creating a data culture, creating data analysts, making st statistics uh, into into creating statistics in throughout your whole organization and eventually becoming an information company. Yeah. Like you said, like the current, uh, uh, and the, and the current era where the majority of companies are using information and data. Yeah. Software will be everything, right? Because software is the means by which you understand the service that is being rendered. <laughs> That's interesting. Like it, it makes me also question like in terms of the startup I'm trying to find and discover myself. <laughs> so like, okay, what does that mean? Should, so I have an idea and then I have to ask for feedback in the early stages. Yes. Yeah. It's about the value proposition, right? Exactly. Propose value. Exactly. Like you said, and then see what's what happens and then build on top of that. All right. Then anything else to add then about uh, this paper? Wow, it's an interesting paper and definitely a recommended read. And it makes me again think like the other papers and books we read uh, about my own assumptions. Basically, okay, how what does that mean for me? How can I use the service, dom service dominant logic in my own pursuit for a startup million dollar company? <laughs> Hi, Alex here. I'm back to close out this episode of the Innovation Book Club with a few prompts and questions to take your learning further. Before we start, however, here's a quick note about why we're actually doing this. We believe that the value of learning is not in knowledge acquisition. Its value lies in the reflection process. When you judge the value of the knowledge that you've been exposed to, you understand how that analysis changes your view of the world and then ultimately how that knowledge and understanding increases both your capacity and capability to engage with and shape the world around you. So to that end, what we've done is we've come up with a few questions to help you reflect on what you've just heard and to try and push you on with your own innovation learning journey. So here they are. One. 
To what extent do you agree that the purpose of all marketplace transactions is for a supplier to render service to their customers? Two, choose a company you admire. How important is service dominant logic to their success? Three, how could your work be improved by adopting service dominant logic principles? These questions are also in the podcast notes together with additional links. If you'd like to read or watch something else related to this episode, good luck with your answers and let us know how you get on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Innovation Book Club. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can do three things to help us grow our audience. First of all, please leave us a five-star review on your podcatcher of choice. This helps to feed the algorithm. Second, share this episode with your friends and colleagues if you think they would benefit. And finally, if you'd like to listen to all future episodes of the Innovation Book Club as soon as they're available, then please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, take care and we'll be back soon.